and welcome to a brand new episode of In the Spotlight. I am in Hazira Surat and we have a very special guest today. His name is Anil Parab. He sits on the board of Larsen and Tubro and he oversees the heavy engineering business. This facility that you see here is the world's number one heavy engineering facility. Our conversation is going to be on engineering technology and what makes Parab a fantastic triathlete. For more on the story, come with me. Thank you for coming on the show, Mr. Parab. Yeah. Pleasure to My be. pleasure. Thank you. Welcome to AM Nike Heavy Engineering. Conference. Thank you, sir. So this is a world-class manufacturing facility. Uh, tell me something about the, the products which make India proud. I think this is a facility which is globally benchmarked. As you said, today number one mm. in heavy engineering. Mm. Uh, this offers end-to-end -end solution. That means on one end, we start melting scrap. Second end, we make the heavy reactors, which go to 52 countries across the world. Mm. And we have a waterfront here. Mm -hmm. So where uh, the ship comes, mm -hmm. takes this reactor to all parts of the world. So this is something very unique proposition. That is what we offer over here. And these reactors that we see behind go to which of which countries do they? These go to? are going to USA, mm -hmm. the Darrow Blue, uh, Blue Ammonia project. So okay. these are all part of the green initiatives. So they are with the carbon capture. So that's where it is a Blue Ammonia project. Okay. You, the world actually buys from China. Yeah. And I understand you export to China. Yes. Okay. So yes. tell us something more about it. Yeah, I think I have, we have been exporting to China right from 1990s. And uh, there are certain technologies where the capability doesn't exist mm. in China. Mm. And now, of late, from 2005, they have developed some, some of those capabilities. Mm. However, we still export at mm. least 6 to 7% of our products mm. to China, mm. mainly petrochemical reactors and the special high pressure, high temperature heating. And mm. we also had exported gasifiers, coal gasification. Most of the coal gasification plants in China are all supplied from this plant. Wow. Today, technology is a buzzword. There's technology everywhere. What are the latest technology stack that you deploy in this plant? A very good question. In fact, you name it. We started in 2017 with uh, IIoT, smart workstations, in internet, of things mm. and uh, now we are using robotics the cobots artificial intelligence mm. see all of this we are using deploying in this particular complex as a result what earlier two of the workmen used to man one station mm. today one welder is manning three to six stations that is one thing which is possible some of the complex work of the design engineers hmm. can be done by the artificial intelligence. Non-destructive testing, cobots are going around the reactor, collecting the ultrasonic signals through Wi-Fi. It goes to the non-destructive testing, artificial intelligence, analyze it, and you have the report ready. As industrialization takes place globally, we know there is some amount of impact to the environment. I believe you have done some very interesting work here for protecting the environment. I would say that was always there from the day this plant was started. This plant, which is around 750 acres, has more than 36,000 trees planted by our customers, employees, business associates. And this is a very old, rich tradition. We are now planting almost 2,500 to 3,000 trees every year. That is one thing. We're also doing a lot of rain harvesting here. 73% of the water what we are uh, using hmm. is recycled. And we have a target to become water neutral by 2030. Hmm. Carbon footprint has been reducing year on year. And a lot of initiatives what we have taken towards that to reduce our carbon footprint by improving efficiency of furnaces, 
we have india's first green hydrogen plant operating here from august 2022 all our furnaces pre heating 15% of the gas is a green hydrogen produced in that plant so i would say that we definitely have a plan to make it a role model csg uh, plant you also have mangroves but you told me yes we have planted mangroves recently because what we realize when there is a limit to planting trees within our complex why not go outside and that's where we started planting the mangroves from 150 acres yes 150 wow they since the time you came to this facility um there's some very interesting stories of when you came in here um i believe um not the best of times when you took over this responsibility tell us something about it yeah i would say that uh, see i came here when there was the largest uh, labor strike in 2014 so it took five and a half months there was a sort of uh, no trust between unions the management supervisors were lacking confidence discipline issues our customers had lost the confidence so they did not want their uh, projects to be uh, manufactured over here and all this resulted into associated underutilization and first time in the history of heavy engineering we had a large loss of 317 crores and that's the time when i came obviously to rebuild was a challenge by itself and uh, re-establishing that confidence there was also a bit of militancy from right. the unions so the confidence building of the supervisors so it took a time but i am happy to share without any consultant from external uh, agencies we turned around within a year and from there we have never looked back year on year we have constantly improved the performance on all the parameters and that journey continues perhaps that's why you are called the people's leader yes thank you okay so you occupy the you are part of the top brass of glasson and tubro um most people have some guides mentors uh, to kind of guide them do you have anyone and if you have someone or had someone what is that one piece of advice that you remember today um which comes in you know uh, obviously i was fortunate to be mentored by none other than mr rayan nai so he mentored me so i would say that uh, my piece of advice to uh, what i learned from him always focus on long term success never look at only the quarters be focused on the long term success hmm. second hmm. there will be failures hmm. it's not that everything is going to be bed of roses whenever there are failures what is important is what are the lessons learned how do we move ahead by incorporating institutionalizing those lessons learned and build one of the best professional network across the globe these are the three piece of advice i would give to any uh, young today the generation has changed a lot okay um the younger generation wants work life balance and and perhaps they're right absolutely right um you know how, what is that one piece of advice that you would have for young people and let me give a caveat to 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 those who are thinking that any high achiever um you can think of a youtuber you can think of movie stars you can think of you know athletes any high achiever is one who actually puts in a lot of effort okay there's determination there's perseverance you know and they are at it so the the point is that to be a high achiever what is that one piece of advice that you'd give to the newer generation see i think i would uh, first of all agree with what you said there is no quick fix you said a lot of hard work a lot of dedication determination no to opinions you talked about work life balance also actually i would say that yes a lot is being talked about it by the younger generation my piece of advice is find ways of how to do it rather than being more and more reactive i don't know whether you know uh, that i pursue certain hobbies oh, yes. uh, for almost no more than two decades i regularly swim 
I regularly run. I regularly do cycling. I participate in marathons, triathlons. In spite of all my schedule, and I find time and ways so, of doing it. How do you do that? Because you you are you maintain a very busy work schedule. You still have time for cycling. You swim. You're a triathlete. Okay. And when did you take to to swimming, running, swimming? Just just take us a little back in your life. I would say that uh, swimming is one thing which was my love. So right from young age, from my thirties, I have been regularly swimming. Before that, it was more like a leisure hobby. Running, I started really in a competitive running after I cross fifty. You will be surprised to 50. hear that after I cross fifty. And triathlons, I started. You will be even more surprised after I cross sixty. Oh my God! Okay. and i would say that yes i travel a lot what i do is most of our guest houses i keep my sports kit over there so whenever you are there you don't have to carry but when you are traveling other than where guest houses are i always have one bag which is for my all sports gadgets so wherever i am early morning 5:30 i actually you will find me either in a swimming pool or in the on the road running so for me that one hour is like recharging your uh, batteries of the phone wow and you know there are there are a lot of viewers here who actually would want to know how to how to they everybody wants to run do part or or swim or cycle but they don't get the time okay what are two or three things which you could tell us how to do that okay one is passion okay yeah. but to convert that passion into activity how do you do that so let me put it this way that uh, passion is start i talk swimming was my passion running cycling was definitely not a passion it was picked up as you uh, progressed in your career in fact i picked up cycling during pandemic you know when you were stuck with the lockdowns and all that i thought that was one way you can release your stresses and everything in the world was looking gloomy so i used to cycle long distance so you can go close to the nature and all that but to add to what you said how do you find the time i find it other way around actually because you are recharging yourself one hour every day your remaining 23 hours the energy level at which you operate you are able to accomplish much more as compared to others so if you do not charge yourself actually your time will shrink you will not be able to achieve what you are doing so what time do you wake up in the morning i generally uh, is a person who wake up very early so 4:35 i get up and 5:35 45 you will find me either in the pool or on the cycle or on the uh, A road for the running. And how often do you travel usually? Broadly? I would say about fifty, sixty percent of my time I'm traveling. So half the month you're traveling. Yes. And yet you find time. Yes. Wow. And what time do you sleep? Sleep, I would say generally eleven, eleven thirty. So five hours of sleep. Five to six hours. Roughly. Yeah. Five to six hours. And that's that's good enough. Yes. And it's working for you. If you're traveling, in fact, that five to six reduced to even four, three and a half. Because if it is a late night flight mm -hmm. or early morning flight, you okay. have no choice. Okay, awesome, excellent, Mr. Parab. That's wonderful catching up. This has been same such year. An, such an Keep inspiring. Keep coming to this. No, part. no, absolutely, yes. I will. What an inspiring story of yeah. you change this place. You, you can, you know, transform this place. Okay, yeah. from the time you came here to now, your your fitness regimen that's absolutely inspiring, and I wish you the very best. Thank you. So nice of you. Thank you.